Hello, and welcome to your third Generalized Linear Models lecture. Today we're going to talk all about time series data. And time series data are just repeated measurements that are collected over time from the same person or the same system. So for instance, one time series that might be interesting to look at is how much money is in your checking account. Or we might want to look at your heart rate over time. In any case, these are repeated measurements that are from the same system. Them, we're just recording them over time. Now, if we don't have a ton of measurements, we still technically have a time series, but we can handle it in a very different way with a tool we already talked about earlier. For instance, let's say that we're doing a psychology experiment and we're measuring subjects multiple times, let's say pre-treatment, post-treatment, and then we follow up with them a few weeks after treatment. Now, technically, this is like the world's smallest time series, but it still is a time series. We're measuring the same person over and over and over again. And in order to handle data like this, where there's only a couple of measurements, we can actually use mixed effect models. For instance, let's say that we're working in a psychology lab and we have some kind of treatment. Something I used to work with back in my psychology days was brain training. So we're going to give someone a game that is kind of like a brain training game, and we want to see how that improves their memory abilities. First, we're going to measure them before they've had any treatment. Then we're going to give them the treatment. Then we're going to measure them after the treatment and a few weeks after that to see what the long lasting effects are. Now, technically, this is a time series. For most of our participants, we are going to have three repeated measurements over time. And we can handle this very easily with a mixed effect model. Essentially, what we do is we look at the impact of treatment, time, and the interaction between treatment and time, but we allow at least the intercept, if not also the slope, to vary by participant. By adding in these random effects, we're accounting for the fact that we have repeated measures from the same person that normally would violate our assumption of independence. And more practically, this allows us to account for the fact that some people just have better baseline memory or worse baseline memory, and that different people will have different reactions to the treatment. Let's say your memory is already really good, then maybe you're going to benefit a little bit from brain training, but not a ton. And say your memory is really bad. Maybe you have a lot of room to improve, so you're going to have a bigger effect in regards to the treatment. That's exactly what this structure of model allows us to look at. And when we look at the results, we can see something interesting. First of all, we see the results from the random effects. What we want to look at first is the standard deviation column. This, as you heard before, tells us what the variation of those fixed effects are. So for instance, for intercept, we see a standard deviation of about 7.5, which means that people vary a lot in their intercept. I mean, look, the intercept value is 49, and we have a standard deviation of 7.5. So people have very different intercepts. We also see that there's a small standard deviation for the effect of time, meaning that on average, over time, people have different changes from pre, post, and follow-up test. But what's really interesting to us if we want to answer our hypothesis about whether treatment is actually effective is this interaction effect. In this case, we have the interaction of treatment and time. Remember, in an interaction effect, we're looking at how one effect, a fixed effect, changes at different levels of another effect. For instance, we can interpret this interaction as saying, how does the interaction of time and outcome vary for people in the treatment versus the control group? Here, we see that we have a pretty large effect. You can see that our t-value, which we haven't talked a ton about, is huge, meaning that this effect is pretty large, and we're pretty confident that it's a true effect. This tells us that the effect of time, so pre, post, follow-up, is different for people in the control group versus the treatment group. And what does that actually look like? Well, I've plotted it out here. What you can see is that for the control group, while they improve a little bit at follow-up, our third measurement, they're relatively flat over time, whereas the treatment group seems to improve a ton over time. This basically tells us that there's an interaction effect. The effect of time 
is different depending on whether you're in the treatment or the control group. And this makes sense because in this case, that means that the treatment group improved their memory scores while the control group did not. Thus, you can see they have completely different slopes when we look at these lines of pre, post, and follow-up. But most of the time, we're not just going to have a handful of observations in a time series. We're going to have a ton. I mean, why do time series otherwise? So in a regular time series where we have a ton of measurements, maybe tens, hundreds, thousands of measurements, we can break these time series up into three components. First, we have a seasonal component. Seasonal components are variations in your values that are due to some repeating periodic pattern. For instance, let's say that you're selling candles. You might have weekly seasonality because people are more likely to buy candles, let's say Saturday through Monday when they're sort of still in their weekend vibes and less likely to buy them on Tuesday through Thursday. We might also, in the candle business, have yearly seasonality because, of course, everyone's in the mood for a candle in the fall and the winter, but is probably not buying as many candles in the summertime. So we'd have some seasonal pattern due to the time of year. And these periods can be any length of time, but often when we're talking about things that are measured on, say, like a daily or hourly basis, we have typical periods like within a day, a week, a month, a year. Then we also have a trend component. Trend components are how your value is kind of smoothly changing over time. For instance, in the candle business, maybe when you started out, you weren't selling that many candles, but as time goes on, your candle business is exploding and you are just selling more and more candles all the time. And then lastly, we have a noise component. This is just random variations in your measurement that we're assuming we cannot predict. And any time that we have a time series, we might want to first try and decompose the time series into these three components. What we're assuming here in the case of an additive time series is that our values are some sum of a trend component, a seasonal component, and some random variation or noise that we can't really measure. In R, it's super easy to decompose a time series and make a plot looking at these three components. In this plot, you can see our observed data at the top. And then below, you can see these three estimated components, the random noise, the seasonal component, and our trend over time plotted out. In the case of this time series, what we see is that there is a weak linear trend, meaning over time our values are tending to increase. We also have what looks like a very strong seasonal component. You can see here that we have very strong periodicity here. And then whatever is left over is our random or noise component. If we added all these together, we would get our observed data. This can help us understand our data because we can understand trends over time, as well as if there is any seasonality that we might want to account for. For instance, say you work in marketing and you're trying to figure out how to forecast your sales. Well, you might want to take into account things like the trend. Is your business trending up, down, or maybe just staying flat? And then you also want to think about seasonality. For instance, if you are a business that sells swimsuits, you're probably going to do a lot more business in the summer and maybe the spring in preparation for the summer. And that seasonality can kind of help you plan financially for your business. Okay, now that we have the basics down, let's talk about a few building blocks that will help us understand actual time series models that help us understand the data in a time series or even forecast it into the future so that we can do things like plan the budget for a business. The first couple of terms that we need to get familiar with might already be familiar. It's autocorrelation and partial autocorrelation. We've actually talked about autocorrelation, however briefly before, when we talked about Markov Chain Monte Carlo, because in MCMC, samples usually have some autocorrelation since each sample in the chain is dependent on the sample that came before it. In some cases, our MCMC chain basically looked very autocorrelated, where one sample told you a lot of information about what the next sample was going to be. 
just like in this plot. You can see here that knowing what our current value is tells you a lot about what the next value is, so we expect that there is pretty high autocorrelation. But so far, all we've been doing is sort of looking at a plot and going, ooh, that looks autocorrelated. But now we're going to use some tools to actually estimate what this autocorrelation is. The main way that you're probably going to do this is with an autocorrelation plot. The autocorrelation plot plots for every lag, so a lag of one would be looking at the previous item, lag of two would be looking two items back, lag of three, three back, etc, etc, and looks at the correlation between current time points and that lag back for every single entry in our time series. Here, we're looking at lags up to 30. So basically, we're looking at observations up to 30 time steps ago. And in this plot, which is the autocorrelation plot for the time series we saw in the last slide, you can see that we have very heavy autocorrelation. Now, the autocorrelation at lag 0 is always going to be 1 because it's itself there is no lag and therefore we have a correlation of 1. But all of these lags have really high positive autocorrelations. In an autocorrelation plot, we typically have these bands that tell us what range of autocorrelation values we think are basically equivalent to zero. If the autocorrelations are outside those bands, we think there is a pretty notable autocorrelation that is not equivalent to zero. And here we have many, many positive autocorrelations. This means, as we saw in our last plot, that knowing the value at our current time step tells you a lot about what the value at the next time step will be. And what the autocorrelation plot told us is that that's really true for up to 30 time steps. So this is an autocorrelation plot where the time series had high autocorrelation. But what if we look at a plot of a time series that has very low autocorrelation? Here we can see more of that fuzzy caterpillar shape where we don't seem to have a lot of autocorrelation between our different time steps. Let's see if the autocorrelation plot agrees with us. And oh my goodness, it does. If you see, we still have an autocorrelation of one at time step zero because we are correlated with ourselves. But when we look at the different lags, we no longer see huge autocorrelations. Rather, most of them, with one tiny exception, which is pretty common by random chance, that is outside of the bands, meaning that most of these lags have zero correlation with the current time step. Just like we saw in the plot on the slide before, this means that knowing this value at the time step currently doesn't really tell you a lot about the time step in lag 1, 2, 3, all the way up to 30. Okay, well that's autocorrelation. Let's talk a little bit about partial autocorrelation. So we might have a time series where the value of our current time series depends on at least the previous value, y t minus 1, so the time before this, and the value two time steps ago, y t minus two. Here, we're saying that the value of our time series is some coefficient phi to one times the value at the previous time step, plus a different coefficient phi to two times the value two time steps ago, plus of course, a little bit of error. If we drew a DAG, see these things keep coming up, of the relationship between our previous time step t minus one and our time step before that t minus two on our current value, it would look something like this. Now, let's say we wanted to estimate the direct effect of two time steps ago on our current time step. In other words, we wanna know what the relationship is between y t minus two, two time steps ago, and our current time step y t. Well, according to this DAG, we have a little bit of a problem when estimating that effect. One, we have a direct effect. That's what we want to estimate. But y t minus 2 also has an effect through y t minus 1. Because if this is how we determine the structure of our time series, that means that y t minus 1 is also impacted by y t minus 2, because that's the time step before y t minus 1. So there's actually two pathways through which association can flow between t minus 2 and t. There's the direct pathway and the indirect pathway. So if we want to isolate the direct effect rather than the total effect, we need to do a little bit of calculations. 
in order to look at the partial correlation. We're going to look at the covariance between yt and yt minus 2, already taking into account the effect of yt minus 1. In other words, we're subtracting out the effect of yt minus 1. We're then going to scale that by the variance of yt already accounting for the effect of yt minus 1 and the variance of y2 accounting for the effect of yt minus 1. And you might say, that sounds a little bit familiar. And that's because we've already talked about this concept when we talked about how to interpret regression coefficients. In that case, we talked about the difference between correlation and semi-partial correlation. In a regular correlation, we just look at two variables, our predictor x1 and our outcome y, and we look at the amount of variance in y that can be explained by our predictor x1. But in the context of a regression coefficient, where we also had other covariates in the model, we actually looked at semi-partial correlations. This is the correlation between our main predictor x1 and our outcome y, after subtracting the influence of our covariate x2 on our predictor x1. In other words, in this Venn diagram, we're no longer looking at the complete overlap between x1 and y, this overlap between blue and orange. We're only looking at the portion of the overlap that is not accounted for by our covariate x2. Thus, we're looking at the effect of x1 on y after subtracting out the influence of our covariate x2. And in a partial correlation, we're doing almost the exact same thing, except we also subtract the influence of x2 on y. So we're still looking at this overlap in terms of the amount of variance in y that's accounted for by x1, but we're no longer comparing that to all of the variance in y, but rather only the variance in y not accounted for by x2. So we're no longer considering this area here because we've subtracted the influence of x2 both from our predictor x1 and from our outcome, y. And that's exactly what partial autocorrelation does, but of course now we're looking at a time series. In terms of partial autocorrelation, we're looking at the correlation between our current time step and some other time step, in this case, y t minus two, after subtracting out the influence of y t minus one, both from our actual value, y t, and from our quote unquote predictor, y t minus 2. In this case, we're looking at the effect of y of t minus 2 on y of t, so how much influence does two time steps ago have after considering the influence that one time step ago has. In other words, we're isolating the direct effect of y t minus 2 on y t after accounting for the effect that it may have through the intermediary time step y t minus 1. Just like with autocorrelation, we can make partial autocorrelation plots, but instead of plotting the autocorrelation, we plot the partial autocorrelation. Similarly to before, we are basically looking for partial autocorrelations that are outside the blue bands of what we would typically expect or what we think is not different than zero. In this case, almost all of our correlations are within these bands, with a couple poking out a little bit. So these may have some significant partial autocorrelations, but they're not very big and they're not very different than zero. The next building block we need to talk about in order to talk about time series modeling is stationarity. Stationarity in a time series basically means that the time series meets these three conditions. First is that the mean of the time series is constant, so that means that the mean isn't changing over time. In other words, unlike our candle business, which is growing exponentially every year, we would have a same average for the entire time series. The second condition is that our variance is constant. It means that in different portions of the time series, our variation is going to be the same. It's not like there's some portions of our time series where there is very little variation and other portions where there's a ton of variation. Last but not least, we assume that there's no seasonality. In other words, we assume that there is a constant autocorrelation. So you may see the word constant a lot in these conditions, and that's basically what stationarity is. It means that our time series is not evolving or changing over time. It's probably easier to understand stationarity if I show you time series that do not follow stationarity. So here's an example of a time series that is not stationary. 
highly recommend you pause and see if you can figure out why based on our three criteria for a stationary time series. All right, trusting that you paused, one of the things that we notice here is that it does seem to have a constant mean. If we look at different portions of the time series, they all seem to oscillate around zero. So we didn't violate that constraint. And I don't really see any clear seasonal patterns here. So we didn't violate that constraint, but there's one more left. The variance is constant across the time series. That is clearly violated. Here you can see that on the left hand, like earlier in our time series, the variance is much smaller than it is later in the time series. So this is not stationary because we violated the assumption that our variance is constant. Here's another non-stationary time series. Again, pause, see if you can figure out why this is non-stationary. The answer is that it doesn't have a constant mean. If we look at the time series, we can see, again, there's no real seasonal pattern here that we can tell, and the variance looks relatively constant across the entire time series. However, the mean is changing drastically. You can see that at the beginning of the time series, the mean is very high, and at the end, it's getting pretty low. So this is a non-stationary time series. Here's a third non-stationary time series. Here we see the mean actually looks relatively constant. It's always around zero, and the variance across the time series looks constant as well. But I now see some very, very clear seasonality. You can see it almost looks like a sine wave going up and down and kind of oscillating over time. So this is also not a stationary time series. And why is this important? Well, it turns out that a lot of time series models assume that your time series is stationary. So we need to often check to see if that's the case to see if these models are appropriate for us to use. Quick little terminology, white noise is another term that comes up a lot in time series. Essentially, white noise is that completely unpredictable random noise that we're not really able to model. And one of the ways it's useful is we can see, have we actually accounted for all of the parts of our time series that are predictable? If all that's left over is white noise, then we probably have. And white noise is similar to a stationary time series. In fact, white noise is a type of stationary time series where the mean is not only constant, but it is zero. The variance is constant and there is no autocorrelation whatsoever. So I just told you that many time series models assume a stationary time series, but from all of the examples I've given you earlier in this lecture, it seems like non-stationary time series are pretty common. So are we just out of luck? Are non-stationary time series just useless to us? Well, the answer is no. Here's a time series that is not stationary. In fact, it's generated using this pattern where our observed value is some intercept plus some coefficient times time plus some random error. So essentially what you see is a linear trend with a little bit of error. And this is very clearly non-stationary. It violates the assumption that the mean of the time series is constant. So based on what I said, we wouldn't be able to do anything with this. But what if we used our current time series to create a new time series? For instance, let's say we created a time series called Z of T, where every single entry in this time series is one of our observed values minus the value that came before it. In other words, we're creating a new time series by differencing each item with the item that came before it. If we plug in the formula that we said it generated the time series, we get something that looks like this middle equation. And if we simplify, we can see that z of t is going to be our coefficient beta 1 plus our error at time t minus our error at time t minus 1. Now, this is a really great practice for all of your random variable stuff we covered earlier in the semester, but I want you to look at what is the mean and the variance of our new time series, z of t. Highly recommend pausing and seeing if you can figure it out. All right, trusting that you paused, here is the answer. The expected value or the mean of our time series is just going to be the expected value of beta 1 plus the expected value of our error term at time t minus our expected value of the error term at t minus 1. Well, we can use what we know about time series to help us figure that out what this is. 
First of all, the expected value of a constant is just the constant. So the expected value of beta 1 is beta 1. And because these are two white noise error terms, we also know these expected values. The expected value of our error term is 0. So we have B1 plus 0 minus 0, so our expected value is B1, which is a constant. So we're on our way to being stationary. Next, we need to know what the variance of our time series is. Well, the variance of our time series is going to be the variance of the error at time t minus the error at time t minus 1. Where did B1 go? Well, the variance of a constant is nothing, so we can just ignore it. And so all that's left is the variance of these two things. And what we have here is two completely uncorrelated random variables with some variance sigma. So if you go back to all of our random variable sums and stuff like that, you might be able to figure out the variance of our time series is going to be two times sigma squared. And oh my god, that also looks like a constant value. So we've taken a time series that is not stationary, and just by creating a slightly different time series that predicts the difference between time steps, we have now created a stationary time series. So we could then apply any of our time series models that we'll talk about later to this new stationary time series. All right, those are just the building blocks. In class, we'll talk a little bit more about some actual time series models, but that is all I have for you today. I will see you next time.